Hello and welcome to the fourth in the series of Building Emotional Resilience. I am absolutely delighted to be joined by Jerry Hussey, also known as the Soul Coach. And who better to really focus on the topic of this evening, which is the new era of consciousness. And we're going to discuss how to awaken. So if you have been to uh, some of my uh, Building Emotional Resilience series before, you'll know that I love to keep them interactive. We've already got some fantastic chat going on the side there. There's polls. I'm gonna be doing a competition to win some really fabulous prizes about halfway through the event. And I love to, to get your feedback and to really, you know, if you have questions, you can ask them down below. I'm hoping we'll get to them. I can't promise because I do want to keep this to 60 minutes this evening because Miriam and Jerry are in the middle of bedtime with their lovely little son, Eli. And anyone who has kids or can remember having kids that young, it is actually such a, such a time that you really need to be um, calm and the house is calm. So we're gonna be very mindful of that. And what I ask you to do here, everyone who's here, you're all incredibly welcome. There's over 300 people registered here. And what we're going to do is I'm going to ask you for something before we start. And I'm going to ask you to give it to myself and I'm going to ask you to give it to Jerry. And that is something very, very precious. It's the most precious thing we have. And it is your attention. So for the next 60 minutes, can you actually really just slow down your mind let go of everything else that's going on in your life right now. Give your full attention to this. No sort of check on Instagram quickly. None, none of the sort of distractions that we are so accustomed to. And in fact, I, I was reading recently a book called Stolen Focus. I don't know if you've heard of it, Jerry, um, by Johan Harry. And he talks about that we're living in an attentional pathogenic culture. And those words really just kind of landed with me. They, they stayed with me because it is so um, pervasive. And what the biggest distraction we have is our phones that we're, we're, we're just absolutely, you know, and it's very unconscious, a lot of it. Um, there was one study actually done where they, they took 136 students and they uh, some of the students were allowed to have their phones and half them weren't. And the, the, the students who had their phones during the exam got 30% less in their overall uh, result at the end because they were getting those little uh, notifications and interruptions. So please do, for the purpose of this time together, keep that in mind and use this time actually as a meditation and experience for you to see, can you keep coming back to the moment? And let's, let's work on that together. So previous guests that I've had on this webinar are um, series are uh, Pat Dibley, Dr. Mark Rowe and Louise Carroll, who all offered incredible insights. And this evening, what I really want to focus on, and I think it's particularly pertinent, is the idea of this new era of consciousness and how the world really does need to wake up in terms of how much suffering there has been and throughout history, uh, obviously, but in, the, in our time, what we're going through, you know, we, we've experienced uh, obviously this climate change anxiety. We have had COVID in recent years. And now there's the war in Ukraine, which is devastating and is causing a lot of anxiety, I see, with clients and friends, etc. So please do, if you can, all donations this evening are going to the Red Cross. Uh, so you can see there's a button down there. And if you haven't already, please do consider um, donating. It would be fantastic. So in terms, Jerry, and this is really where I want to, to get your amazing insight, is the idea that suffering quite often is what really provokes awakening, if you like, that the suffering can get so intense for people. And Eckhart Tolle, who I'm a big fan of, talks about this, that that is, in fact, often the energy that awakens people. It's not always, but it is something that can be used, if you like, to really start to transform something that is very negative and destructive into something that becomes much more uh, powerful. So do you, would you agree with that? What do you think, Jerry? Uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Fiona. First of all, congratulations on a great series. Congratulations on the great work that you do. We've had you in Soul Space community and people are still talking about your, your, your session. So I'm just honored to be part of this and honored to be on with you tonight. So and welcome to everybody. 
Um, I think I think we're born to wake up. I think we're born to wake up, and I think it's a natural evolution in the human being to move through levels of consciousness, levels of awareness. And the more we move through levels of awareness, is the more we let go of suffering. We actually realize what matters, what doesn't really matter. However, in our modern world, there are so many sedatives that are keeping us sleeping, processed food, phones, news. We're being bombarded by stuff that keeps us in a state of fear. And we know that when we keep people in a state of fear, the amygdala in the brain wakes up, the, uh, the prefrontal cortex shuts down, and now your chemistry, your biology is in a state of fear. So you're going to lock down, shut down mode, and your, your immune system switches off. Mm -hmm. So we're born to wake up, but in order to wake up, we need to be in a, a place of joy and love and gratitude. Mm -hmm. We cannot wake up in a state of fear. And unfortunately, we live in a state, a world where we're constantly bombarded with fear. So the first question I have is, what's stopping us from waking up? Mm -hmm. And then secondly, most of us use an alarm in the morning. So it's an external mechanism that wakes us up. Mm -hmm. And sometimes crisis is that. But people who work on circadian rhythms, people who work in harmonizing their own biological clock can actually wake up without the alarm clock. Mm -hmm. So likewise, often people who are asleep need an external thing to shock them into awake. But I think when we proactively decide to wake up, I think we begin to realize when we shift out of fear-based and we begin to awaken consciousness, mm -hmm. we naturally begin to wake up. So I think crisis forces us to wake up, but I think the more natural and the, more, the better way to wake up is, is to wake up naturally because why should we wait for a diagnosis or a crisis before we do something positive mm -hmm. and what we've always tried to do in soul space is to proactively help people wake up before they get sick because we know in ireland we don't have a health care system we have a sick care system it waits for you to get sick and then when you're sick it does something so we are about proactively allowing people to awaken consciousness that's lovely, Jerry. You know, when you said there just a moment ago, like we're born to wake up, is it is it fair to say, or you know, that that we we are when we're born, we're already woke, if you like, and it's it's the sort of process after that that we start to lose our innate presence and consciousness. I think I think there's two ways. I think from a very simple point of view, firstly. If you think of a baby, in most of my talks I use, and in, in my book, the only picture I have is the picture of my, my son, Eli. Yes. We're born as a baby. And as a baby, we are in theta brainwaves. And in theta brainwaves, we can download information quick. Your brain is developing really fast. We're making synaptic connections at a record speed. We're forming our belief systems. We're also, from a chemical point of view, as a baby, we're high in oxytocin, which is your love snuggle hormone. Mm -hmm. So... Everything in our human system, in our human biology, in our human chemistry is set up for love, for gratitude, for fun, for adventure, for enjoyment, for learning. So we're born with, as babies, we don't have self-criticism. We don't have anger. We don't have judgment. We don't, we don't, we've no fear. We trust, we love, we engage something happens in us after that, whether it's our education system where we start to learn things like self-criticism, judgment, fear. And that little baby that looks at the world and says, what an incredible place. And I can do anything I want. Mm. Suddenly switches to this person says, I'm not good enough. That wouldn't work out for me. And I, so I think we're born with everything, we're, the very fact that we learn to walk means that we're agile, we're intrinsically motivated, we, we're, we're resilient, we bounce, we get back up. But something switches off and something in our society switches off that spirit. Now, on a deeper level, when we look at consciousness, what is consciousness? Consciousness is electricity. So... In order to understand the human being, you have to understand that we are biological and we are chemical, but we are also electrical. 
there is a huge amount of electricity running through each and every one of us right now. Everybody's brain right now is generating 23 watts of electricity, almost enough to power a light bulb. The problem with current medicine is it's using Newtonian physics. It's only focusing on the biological and the chemical. And it's completely missing the electrical. But we know that nothing biology, nothing matter can move, grow, or evolve without electric electricity. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about consciousness, consciousness is the non-physical part of being. It is the electrical or what we call the unified field, or in physics we call it the quantum field. And from that quantum field, everything takes shape. Everything becomes matter. Even Einstein said, to understand anything, you have to understand that everything begins as a vibration or a frequency. So as human beings, I exist in this form for a period. But then this form will be will die. This biological body will die. But my energy, and we know energy cannot be deconstructed. It can only be moved. So as human beings, we're moving from form to non-form to form. We know from a molecular level that each human being was actually stars. We are stardust. We're recycled stardust. Yeah, we're all stars. <laughs> it's fantastic. Well, we are stars. So we are, when, yeah. we, when we awaken to true or what we call unified consciousness, mm -hmm. we suddenly begin to realize that this body that exists, this Jerry, is only temporary, it's only a temporary form of me. Mm -hmm. So when we begin to think of consciousness, we can look at it as the simple electricity that we know is running through the body. And then the big question is, where does that electricity come from? We know the brain doesn't generate electricity. And we know that the brain doesn't generate thought. So if the brain and the body doesn't generate the electricity, then the big question is, where does the electricity come from? And that is your spirit. That is your soul. That is what med medicine is missing at the moment. Yes. There is no life. There is no, nothing biological can happen without electricity. Mm -hmm. So we have to move beyond our physical understanding and move into that field of energy, electricity to really understand what consciousness is. That's a very long-winded answer, but that's probably 30 years of research for me oh, to try and get to that point. Yeah, yeah, no, it's very well expressed. And I think that what it what it offers us really is the, the that really essential aspect of the oneness of us all. So if I am that energy, you are that energy. And that I think is is really helpful to people who are struggling with anxiety, whether it's about the war or COVID or climate change or any of these sort of things that seem above and beyond and out of our control, that really the way that, that, that we're going to be able to, you know, as a collective consciousness, if you like, is, is to break through that, mm -hmm. is by each and every one of us realizing that. And therefore, when I hurt another person, if there's violence there, if there's hatred there, if there's, if there's any kind of um, negative energy that is going towards another being, I also hurt myself. And that is, you know, a core principle that when and if we can all collectively engage with that, then that is that is such a huge part of, of our ability to create a more peaceful world. Of in course. Terms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I think what drives it, Fiona, is we have this narrative that we are the most enlightened species on the planet. But the only person saying that are humans. We're the only people that are, kill each other. We're the only people that are destroying the planet. Like when we look at the sea and the stars and when we look at planets and when we look at this incredible earth that we sit on that is, mag is held in a magnetic field, never speeds up, never slows down its rhythm. Everything else in, in the universe has beautiful rhythm and order except us. Mm we are struggling to find our place. And as human beings, we have this ludicrous idea that we are top of the chain so that everything in the earth is here to serve us and we have to be lord over everything. We have to forget that. Yeah. We are not in nature. We are nature. 
and we are here to be part of nature. It is a oneness. That's what the word Zen means, oneness. Mm -hmm. But human beings, we're so desperate to find our purpose. Mm -hmm. We're so terrified that we don't matter, that we're constantly afraid of, what if I'm not good enough? What if I don't have enough? And that mentality causes people to stockpile. Like we live in a world where half the world stockpiles resources they don't need, while the other half starve to death. So that's a fear that I won't have enough. Yes. Yeah. So what we have to do is look at how does the rest of nature work? So in a forest, if a tree realizes that another tree is dehydrating, it will redistribute the water. Mm -hmm. Every other thing in nature is designed to help each other thrive. Every yeah. other breed and species is designed to help each other thrive. Mm, that's a lovely way to look at it. Yeah, yeah. But we've gone the opposite way. Well, I think we, we are the same, Jerry. We've just, as you say, it's like we've we've sort of moved so far away from that that yeah. that it's it's almost been forgotten. But innately, that is what we are designed to do, and that's how we thrive. That's how we, you know, it's the only way we can thrive. Mm. Um, just to say there, the polls, I hope people have started to answer them there, but I'll just read them out and please do um, let us know yes or no. So the first poll is, do you feel overwhelmed by the state of the world and in particular because of the war? So at the moment, we've got 44% are saying yes and 55% are saying no. Okay, lovely. Do you watch or listen to the news every day? Uh, most hours, we have 8.3%. A few times a day, 13.5%. Once per day is 29.7%. Uh, so that's okay. And the people trying to avoid it are, oh my goodness, that's amazing. I'm actually quite beautifully su uh, surprised. 46% at the moment are saying that they try to avoid it. That's, it's, it's not what you actually, if you listen to the news, that's not the impression you get, is it? But it's actually very um, hopeful. That's inspiring. That, that's, that's really good. And the fourth one there is, do you understand on an intellectual level the concept of conscious awakening? 41% say yes, and 60% say no at the moment. Do you feel you understand awakening on an experiential level? And I think that's what, you know, I really want us to, to help people with this evening, Jerry, is this idea yeah. of how to awaken. Because people are saying that 24% say they do understand it experience the experiential level, but 75% are saying no. And, and I think that's quite common, isn't it? Do you find that in your experience that people may grasp it intellectually, but how do I execute it? How do I practically live this? Well, I, I think again, it's, it's understanding what stops us from being free, which is fear. So from a chemical point of view, it's really important that we know the difference between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. So when I'm angry, when I speak negative to myself, when I'm listening to something, when I have a deadline coming up, I, my brain fires a signal through my central nervous system of threat that activates the sympathetic nervous system, which increases blood pressure, heart rate. It produces cortisol, adrenaline. It switches off my immune system. It ignites the amygdala and shuts down the prefrontal cortex. So now you become like a monkey. You are in a biological, chemical state of being with your consciousness switched off. So it's basic survival fight. You're in fight or flight mode. And in fight or flight mode, we're not really thinking. We're just fighting. We we're, yeah. we're existing. Now, on the other side of the nervous system, we have what's called the parasympathetic nervous system. And when we start to meditate, when we use our breath, when we express gratitude, when we change the words we use when we listen to different things we now send the brain sends a signal of calm into the nervous system and that ignites the parasympathetic nervous system which creates brain coherence so now your whole brain is beginning to think together your prefrontal cortex open your pineal gland begins to excrete one of the most powerful chemicals in it and instead of cortisol now you're beginning to flood in a, in a chemical called oxytocin so you're changing your chemistry, you're changing your biology. And we know that when we're in the sympathetic nervous system, our immune system starts to upgrade. But now we're in a state of being. So the noise of the body has slowed down. 
we're no longer attached to physical stimulus. Mm -hmm. And now we begin to quieten the body, quieten the nervous system. And now we begin to feel. So a lot of people try to think their way into awakening. The brain is simply a threat detection system. That's all it does. It is nothing more than a way of keeping you safe. And the way it keeps you safe is it keeps you high and high alert. Mm -hmm. So we need to move out of the brain and we need to actually stop thinking mm -hmm. and stop questioning and stop trying to control and stop trying to judge. And suddenly when we do that, we move out of beta brainwave and we move across back into the theta brainwave that we were in as a child the nervous system stops firing threat signals, so it quietens. And suddenly, we're not in a state of fear anymore. Our brain slows down to a point where it's almost silent. And now we begin to hear our consciousness. So we have two parts of our mind. Mm -hmm. One is the part that's thinking. Mm -hmm. And the other part is the part that's aware you're thinking. It's awareness. Exactly. It's the awareness that you are conscious in a sense that you could you're aware of that. And it's it's it is powerful. Um, what I wanted to actually is just to, to sort of help people with this on an experiential level is I want people, if you could share in the chat function. And this is how we're going to select the winners for uh, this evening's competition. So what we have is we have five of Miriam, Jerry's amazing partner, beautiful wife and mother of his son. And they're expecting their second child soon, which is incredibly exciting. And congratulations. I haven't actually been able to say that to you personally. You. I said it to Miriam, but it's, it's wonderful news. Um, so yes, basically Miriam has this lovely um, online material content called May You Be Well. So it's for the month of May. And she's offering uh, five places on that, five memberships to that. And with that, you get a 30 day, which I think is so generous and incredible, is 30 days to the soul space community. If you don't know about the soul space community, you need to know about it. It is the most incredible resource. I've been, as you said, Jerry, fortunate enough to, to be in with you uh, a couple of times and, and very grateful to do so. And it's really such a supportive. I mean, that's the impression I get is that there's a real sense that you work together and that, that there's a real feeling of belonging uh, in the community and which is obviously so important for mm -hmm. our um well-being to to feel community is, is essential so you get 30 days membership into that community which is is really really good and then i am offering um one membership to my brand new online course light up your world so um what i would love for you to do to to be in with a chance to win if you if you like is to simply and what you're winning really is is much more than 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 the prizes if you like you're going to win something that is poignant and i want you to share in the chat just exactly what jerry was referring to there and that is this idea of presence and stillness to see if you can reflect for a moment in your own mind to really help you to soak in what is that like when you are at peace when your mind is not busy with thoughts and you touched on it there jerry how so much of it is when our mind is crammed it's like a you know an attic full of junk that there's so much noise in your in your brain that you can't experience your, your presence is blocked so what i'd love to do is if people could share i remember when and if you could try to be as specific as you can because this is actually where you're going to learn the how because you already know this and that's what i think is crucial in terms of executing it is that we we know what that feels like and sometimes it takes us by surprise it can be moments like you see an amazing sunset and you just stop and like your, your mind is quiet, there's stillness, and you are totally absorbed into the here and the now. Another example could be, you know, I'm sure you, as, a, as a dad, Jerry, you feel it all the time, and you're obviously going to be very, you know, uh, prone to this anyway, but just a little moment of a smile from Eli, and the world stops, it's still. And those are the moments that, that we really want, and, you know, in terms of like, 
positive neuroplasticity. We're trying to stretch those out so that you start to know what that feels like on a very visceral, physical level. So share with us in the chat function and we will choose um, six names at random, okay? And I'll, I'll read some of them out. So just take a moment, you know, you can do it at any point during the uh, webinar, um, but be specific and share that moment. I think it would be really, really useful. Um, so in terms of keeping it in this practical side of things, Jerry, like how do you, like, how do you awaken each day? What are, what are the practices that you carry out? Yeah, so for me, it's a code, calendar of daily events. And for me, calendar of daily events means little things that I do every day. And I don't just do them when I feel like it. So I think we live by principle or we live by an emotion. My emotions fluctuate. <laughs> and if, if my activities and my actions fluctuate, then I'm, I, I'm all over the place. So there are certain things that I do each and every day. And I break my code into mind, body, spirit. So firstly, we need to energize our body every day. We are born to move. And when we move, we flood ourselves in, in amazing chemicals. We change the chemistry. We ignite our central nervous system. So I heard a great expression the other day, and it says, we know the massive impact on mental health and mental fitness that exercise have to the point, and this was a great expression, if you're not exercising regularly, you're actually taking depressants. That is the power of movement. Yes. Now, a lot of people think exercise has to be in the gym, it has to be hard with people shouting at you. I don't go to the gyms, I don't have people shouting at me, it could be boxing, it could be yoga, it could be jumping in the <laughs> But we need to energize our body every day. So that's the first thing I would do. The second thing is we know the importance of good brain access. We know now that so much of anxiety and depression and even, that, even uh, dementia and Alzheimer's are now called type 3 diabetes. You cannot be mentally well, consciously awake if your diet is poor. We live in a world where we are bombarded with processed food. Mm -hmm. The three biggest killers on the planet right now is not COVID. Mm -hmm. It's cancer and it's chronic illness caused by stress, processed food and lack of exercise. Mm -hmm. So the second thing I do, and I don't eat perfectly, I, I, I like food that everybody eats, but I really begin to ask myself, what's in this food? Is it nourishing me really? So the second thing is acknowledge the good brain axis and how powerful it is. Become aware of your diet. Little things like starting your day with hot water and lemon is so, so powerful. Reducing caffeine. We know that caffeine sends a direct signal to your adrenal gland to produce adrenaline, which is your stress hormone. Mm -hmm. So caffeine and stress are directly linked. Reduce caffeine, reduce stimulants, reduce alcohol. I'm not saying cut them out. So mm -hmm. move the body and then nourish it with good stuff. Mm -hmm. And then my mind. The two things I find really good for my mind is meditation. Mm -hmm. So I try to meditate almost every day. Mm -hmm. And meditation can be where I'm just lying on the floor, listening to nothing. Or it might be where I'm listening to Louise Hay or somebody else or even my, one of my own meditations and I'm being guided. So yeah. I stop. I switch off in the external world and I use my breath and I use just that slow everything down. Another thing I do for my mind is visualization. So we have to visualize the day we want. We have to visualize the, how we want our day to go. So I use visualization, I use meditation, and then for my spirit, my soul, I ask myself, what would make me laugh today? <laughs> what would make my soul what would bring me joy and then prayer is a big big part for me so that prayer is connecting to something bigger than myself mm -hmm. and because i have a big faith in a god mm -hmm. i don't need to control everything i don't need to understand everything mm -hmm. and even if something is happening in my life that i don't want or that i didn't predict or that I didn't expect i don't judge it as wrong mm -hmm. because something bigger than me is planning it so I would say move the body every day, really limit and cut down processed food, visualization, meditation, and finally something that brings you more joy, more fun, more love. 
Lovely, Jerry. Yes, that's a really strong. I haven't heard it like that. It's 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 a very clever way of expressing it in terms of you know not exercising is like taking a depressant. You know, it's it's that's how strong an impact it has on us. Yeah. Um. And I suppose the same as well for our nutrition. You know, and those are like the you know um like I'm studying at the moment the pillars of lifestyle medicine. You know, those are the the, the really strong ones that without them you know you can't build on that so those are the foundations yeah. along with sleep yeah. um you mentioned uh visualization and as a clinical hypnotherapist that's a huge part of my work um in helping people to really tap into their imagination um but it must sort of commence if you like with the presence and that's why presence and awareness is it to my mind it is again the foundation of which we can build from without it we're in the dark quite literally um yeah, yeah and and that is something that we need to to cultivate and and like you say you know there's that sense of of commitment to yourself that you by showing up and and as you say you might not feel like it but you're not being led by your emotions and i think for people here you know and certainly in my work with clients i see that where the emotion takes over and it's it then you know they, they sort of feel at the mercy of the emotion whereas mm. emotions are really pointers aren't they to to yeah. what's going on mm. we can notice our emotions but mm. not to be identified by them and certainly not yeah. to be yeah. controlled by them um, I, I think yeah. something that really helps there is you know a lot of people know what health and happiness looks like and we we know how there's no mystery out there there's no mystery how what food to eat. There's no mystery. So we know what and how. Why do we not do it then? I think we lack a why. I think sometimes we feel that I shouldn't be taking time for myself, that I need to give my time to everybody else, that it's selfish of me. We really need to get rid of that. Because first and foremost, your health matters. Your dreams matter. You haven't been put on this planet as a mistake. You are as equal to the stars, to the sight, to see. There is nothing on this planet that's more important than you. Everybody is equal. And when we say we're equal, it means that nobody is more important than me. But we've kind of been brought up, Fiona, to not say that, to kind of downplay ourselves. When I started doing the work with Louise Hay, I started saying things like, I am a kind, beautiful human being. I deserve all the love in the world. My health matters. I kind of felt that's wrong. I shouldn't be saying that. We need to forget that nonsense. Mm -hmm. And we need to we need to say that every human being is equal. So nobody's nobody's worse than me, mm -hmm. but nobody's better than me. Mm -hmm. So we have to treat ourselves with that kindness and love and respect that we treat everybody else. Absolutely. And then, and then the last piece for me is mm -hmm. like Eli is only two years old. Mm -hmm. If he gets married, it's probably 30 years away. <laughs> I have to ask myself a question. Do I want to be there? And if I want to be there, do I want to be there and ill or do I want to be there and happy and healthy? Now, I'm going to ask people to put a poll. You might have a look in here. Mm -hmm. If I walked into an Irish hospital today, and these stats are pretty worldwide, but if mm -hmm. I walked into an Irish hospital today, I want people to give me a percentage what percentage of people are in that hospital with a lifestyle-based disease? Something that was caused by too much stress, bad diet, lack of sleep, pushing themselves too hard. What percentage of hospital cases right now are actually caused by lifestyle? Yeah, okay. well, let's let's put it in now. I'm just typing it in as you speak here. Yeah. My life. So non-communicable disease is really what you're saying, isn't it? It's, yes. It's yes. Yeah. Okay. So let's say what percentages will we give? Will we give uh 20 percent? Because I have to put in answers here. So 20, 50. Um, what else, Jerry, would be do you think a good 80 percent? Well, I know, I know exactly. So I'll you tell know, you that. Don't, in say it yet. don't say it yet. What yeah, I'm no. saying is I'll put in these just as a kind of um, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I put it in there, right? Uh, there's other polls. So as people are voting on that, I'll just go and read um, some of the other ones that are up. Is your mind mostly in the present, in the past, or in the future? So in the present, we've got eleven 
10% in the past 42 and in the future 47. That's another very useful thing to do is to notice where is your mind going? Is it more into the past or into the future? And just noticing that about yourself. Do you feel that you are compassionate to yourself? 42% are saying yes. I'm really, really happy to hear that. And 57 are saying no. Uh, do you feel that you are compassionate to others? 100% are saying yes. Now, wouldn't it be lovely to actually see the, are you compassionate to yourself 100%? Because why not? If you can be compassionate to others, you can be compassionate to yourself. Mm. Do you trust your heart gut instinct? 63% say yes, and 34% are saying sometimes. I think that's a very important thing to execute as well. And then, okay, here we go. We've got 80, 92% are saying about 80% of people are in hospital because of lifestyle. So, Jerry, you could tell us what, what is the... Okay, so the this is a worldwide acceptance now and the very fact that people said 80 percent that tells you what we already know yes the truth is between 80 to 90 percent mm -hmm. of hospital cases are lifestyle-based diseases mm -hmm. you can go on the irish heart foundation or lay a healthcare which i work with and i'm going to give you another interesting fact since the beginning of covid which we've lost five thousand people which is terribly sad We've lost 20,000 Irish people through heart disease. Mm -hmm. The Irish Heart Foundation has medically defined 80% of those deaths as totally preventable. Let that sink in for a minute. So if I want to be at Eli's wedding, 80% mm -hmm. of whether I'm there and healthy or not comes down to my daily actions. That is the power of beginning to take proactive control of our health. Mm. Sickness doesn't just happen. In some very rare cases, and we're talking probably 10%, it is caused by something outside of our control. Now, I got slated when I said this 20 years ago, Fiona. I got yeah. slated by GPs, I got that? slated by doctors. I'm not getting slated anymore. Yes. Because people can't deny it. Stress mm anxiety and processed food, no meditation, not enough exercise, living in a sympathetic dominant state. Mm. We are eating and living and thinking ourselves into a state of sickness. So why is self-care important? The reason I'm saying all of this is that you are somebody's hero. Whether it's your husband, your wife, your mom, your dad, your child, somebody needs you around. And somebody needs you around for a long time to help and guide them. Yes. And that yes. should be the fire that motivates us in the morning. It is not selfish to say yes to self-care. It is not selfish to honor your mind and your body. It is not selfish to turn other people down at times to protect yourself. Mm -hmm. I think we have to finally... Imperative. You're right, yeah. Absolutely, Jerry. And I think that that, you know, that's a really good point in terms of people often don't they forget that they are somebody's hero because, you know, they maybe are focused on who they need and who they love. But it, it can we can forget that we are also that person to somebody, you know, whether it's a mother or a sister or whatever the relationship is mm -hmm. that somebody out there, as you say, is so dependent on you being healthy and well. And it's actually selfish not to take care of yourself i mean that's I, I go as far as to say it is because you are not looking after this really valuable uh entity that means so much to yeah. to yeah. yourself but also to the people that love you um i'm going to read some of these uh lovely little um things that have come in when i ask the question about presence and what I hope that this will really do is help everybody here to start to, to, to sort of relate to it and also to, to really soak in that, that feeling because that's what I want for, for people as much as possible. So Neve says, you're really welcome, Neve. She says, when I'm at peace, it feels like I'm connected to others. I feel powerful, free and part of something big and meaningful. I can remember sitting outside to catch my breath after a run recently and suddenly hearing all the sounds in my environment, like birds singing, farm machinery, etc. 
that up until that point had been drowned out by my thoughts and worries. I even saw flowers in my garden that I hadn't noticed before. Neve, that is absolutely, that. that's so, so helpful because what you've done there is actually really highlighted the essence of it, I think, don't you, Jerry, in terms of everything was there already. You know, the flowers were in the garden, the birds were singing, mm-hmm. but you couldn't, it's like a blindness. And I think that's where the waking up comes from. It's, I now see, you know, like what I, what was already there is now apparent to me because I have awoken to mm-hmm. what is, is already there. Nothing's changed outside of you, but you, the way that you are interpreting the world has shifted completely through the stillness and stillness is, is where it comes from. So that's a lovely one, Neve. Thank you. And I hope that it helps um, other people here. Um, so let's see, I'll read another one. Uh, who is this? There's no name there. Roisin. Uh, very welcome, Roisin. Peace is standing in the garden in the morning, looking up to the sun to get my natural light first thing. Well, you know about your circadian clock. Well done, Roisin. I love to hear it. Uh, that's a good tip as well, isn't it, Jerry? To, to get as much light as you can. Yeah, as early as you can. Warm drink at hand and bare feet on the grass. If it is 30 seconds or five minutes, I feel present. I feel part of it all at one with all that is around me, calm and worry-free. Another really lovely example, and we see that nature is something that 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 does ground us, doesn't it? Like that, you know, you can see those two examples there are, are bringing nature into it. And I suppose what, in terms of, a, from a practical perspective, what we want is that it doesn't have to be, you know, there's not always a sunset that we're going to see, or we're not always, maybe the birds aren't singing that day, or, you know, whatever it is but that we have that sort of muscle, if you like, that training um, that our parasympathetic nervous system is a default as opposed to something that um, we have to have something external to create it, but that it's it's within us, whether it's gray, whether it's sunny, et cetera. And I think that's really where, yeah, it's it's important. Um, But we do see that nature, it's, it's almost like a, a sort of um, a springboard for people to awaken, which is, is really, really nice. Um, so we're going to finish at 8.30. I think Miriam is with Eli, um, but she's yeah. here with us in her presence is here. She's oh, put course, the bed. Yeah. But um, if you don't know Miriam's work, I really recommend you follow her on Instagram as well. And um, we'll put in the Instagram soul space. If you're not already following them, please do. And also Miriam and Jerry are there as well. Yeah. So, What I want to do is I'm just going to have a little look at these questions that have come in. Mm. And um, one of them is, Jerry, can you suggest, recommend techniques you use to connect with energy? Yeah. um, Meditation for me is really important because to connect with our our higher self or frequency, we have to get out of the noise of the brain. So we know that by changing the brain wave. And we all, I hope most people know now we have electricity, we have brain waves. And when we sleep, we move through different brain patterns, brain waves. So we can measure these, we can see these. We have to get out of bed a brain wave. So whether that's meditation or whether it's gratitude, we have to slow the brain down in order to begin to feel what's actually the most powerful frequency, the most powerful magnetic force in your body is your heart. So things like gratitude, love, That's where we begin to feel. That's where we begin to open our heart. The biggest illusion and the biggest mistake that we make is we think that everything is not connected. So this idea of separation. So Newton believed that between two physical objects was empty space. Einstein proved that the empty space is not empty. It's connected. So every single thing in this universe is connected. So to think that you're not connected to the sun You're not connected to the moon. You're not connected to the sea. To think that the moon can move the oceans and you're 80% water, to think it doesn't impact you is ludicrous. Mm -hmm. So when we begin to think of connection, there is nothing that separates us. Every single thing we do is connected and every single thing we are is connected. So for me, like you're saying, I focus at nighttime. I love to watch the stars. Mm. And I think about 
I think about some of those stars exploded 98 million years ago. And it's taken that light 98 million years at the speed of light to get here. So how big is the universe? I begin to think about the power of the sun, and yet it's perfectly coordinated. There is a, a, a form of science called thermodynamics, and I talk about this a lot in my book. And it's a hard science, nothing to do with religion, it's hard science. But thermodynamics has a number of rules. The second rule is that in a closed system, if disorder gets into it, then disorder eventually takes over and the whole thing falls down. And yet in the universe, with the sun, the moon, everything is perfectly ordered. Okay. Temperatures, the pitch of the earth. So thermodynamics has now got to a point where it says, if it is to obey the rules of science, then we have to accept that the universe was intelligently designed and intelligently maintained. So what they're saying is there has to be an energy field outside of the universe that is minding and protecting it. And that is the energy field that we can connect to. That is the unified field that the mystics have spoke about since the dawn of day. And finally, science have caught up. So when we begin to just become aware that everything is energy, that the earth is spinning because of energy, gravity is energy, that there is no such thing as empty space, and that you are energetically connected to everything. So when you look at the sun, you're looking at yourself. Mm. I think when we get rid of this sense of separation, mm. we suddenly begin to realize the power that each and, each and every one of us have, the power of connection. Yeah, absolutely, Jerry. And it, when you say it's fair to say that that really needs to come from a still mind, like in terms of thoughtless awareness, which is what um, mm. Eckhart Tolle, Tolle would, would describe yeah. it as, is that yeah. ability to, to have space between your thoughts. Because yeah. if there isn't that space, there isn't room for that energy to, to yeah. connect with that energy. And just to share, sorry, go ahead, Jerry, go ahead. Yeah. Said, there's only two ways we can live our life, mm. in love or fear. If mm. we're living in a state of fear, then our brain is dominant because your brain is a threat detection system. If you're living from a place of love, your heart, and we know now that neurocardiology has proven that your heart has a consciousness. It has neurons just like your gut. You cannot, we, one time ago we thought we'd one brain. Now we know we've three. And we know that the gut and the heart have a consciousness just like the brain, except the heart has a power energy field, more powerful energy field. So when we're thinking, feeling, living from our heart, we're actually now connected to something bigger than ourselves. If we're living from our brain, we're only connecting to the physical stimulus of the central nervous system. Absolutely, so, Jerry. And it's, it's that ability to drop into the heart, isn't it? And you can feel it, you know, when you when you really move, it's like a kind of filtering down away from the mind and in away from the brain and into, into the heart space. And you can, it, it's, it's, it's something that's, it's hard to describe, and that, again, it's back to that experience. But I think Roshi there has a good question. It's, it, it leads me on to what I was going to say in terms of this thoughtless awareness. And one of the, the tools that I use is, for example, let's say I'm walking home from work. And, you know, after a day working with clients, et cetera, the, the mind can be busy, the brain can be busy. So the ability to, let's say, choose a spot that's in front of you, right? You, you sort of look and you say, maybe there's like a, a lamppost or a bush. So, okay, I'm going to give myself space until I reach that. So you, you're, you're literally sort of instructing, and that's how powerful our, our, our minds are, that we can instruct it to be silent. So it becomes like a library. There's no, there's no talking right now. There's just space. And that's where we, we open up to that stillness. So getting that space and really being very mindful about it. You know, for example, you're doing the dishes, you're doing the dishes. You're not trying to, to do anything else. I think that's a lovely, you know, and actually these mm -hmm. everyday chores become opportunities for us mm -hmm. to create that stillness. And yeah. that is the art really, isn't it? It's, it's, yeah. it's the practice of, of consistently coming back. Mm -hmm. But what I want to do, um, we'll answer one more question, Jerry, and then I'm going to just invite people to really, it's sort of like a, 
what I call it a, a words of wisdom meditation, but I'm going to read um, some words written by Thich Nhat Hanh, who I'm sure you are aware of his mm. amazing work. He's a Vietnamese Zen monk, if people um, don't know him. He uh, died this year and he would be very much of the same. Exactly what you were saying earlier, Jerry, you know, this idea that he's not really dead. You know, he's, he's in the clouds, he's in the rain. I am here. So he's, he's present. Um, so it's less about mourning his passing and about um, celebrating his wisdom that, that lives with us. Mm. Um, but before I do that, and, and what I'm going to do is invite people to really slow down their minds and use this um, story, if you like, his wisdom as, as a practice to to focus on as a, as a meditation but let's ask let's uh one more question jerry um for your good and amazing self and i'm really really grateful to you um for your time um okay this is a great question and um, it comes in from sharon and she says is it ever too late to start say you're in your 60s and um because of your lifestyle you're you're ready already I think in the long-term illness stage so there what do you would you say to to Sharon I think the greatest gift in life is to live in peace um you know I've been lucky enough to, in the work I do I get to help different people the most powerful moment of my working career is where a lady who had only maybe three months to live and it was irreversible, no matter what she did at that stage, wrote me the most beautiful letter that will, I will treasure until I am released back into the universe. Mm -hmm. And she said that from the work I did with her, she no longer had fear. Mm -hmm. She was really ready to embrace whatever the universe was willing to give her. Mm -hmm. And she had no regrets. And that she will always know that in this life she achieved incredible peace mm. we think death is the tragedy of life death is just the beginning it's a rebirth mm. the tragedy in life is getting to the end and knowing that we never lived with peace and joy mm. i i would ask everybody to read the five regrets of the dying mm. it's an amazing book mm -hmm. death is just a new step don't worry about death. Worry about getting to that point and having not known peace. It is never too late to know peace. It is never too late to come to realize that you are an incredible connected part of this great universe. You are the universe looking at itself. And you are the stars, you're the sun, and in your multiple lifetimes, you will be all of these things. So whatever is, accept it with love and kindness mm. let go of resistance let go of the need to control that because we as human beings we can't control the tide we can't stop the sun from rising mm. we can only witness it witness your incredible life with gratitude and love and when you look at people who like victor frankel or mandela with every right to be angry and bitter and yet they choose peace yeah. each and every one of us no matter what stage in life no matter what's going on we can choose peace and love and when we awaken our higher consciousness we are no longer a conditioned stimulus fight or flight attack attack run run we can be the peaceful observer in our own life we can witness the unfolding of our own life with joy and peace. And even though things happen that are not as we wanted or not as we expected, it is not the end. It is simply the journey. It's the story. And when we can observe our own life, so what I talk about is the peaceful observer in my own life. And I've gone from this highly anxious kid that first thought about suicide at 11 years old to most of the time, I am the peaceful, joyful observer of my own life. It doesn't mean that bad things don't happen and I don't get things wrong. And things are happening in my life all the time. Yeah. But I choose my response. And I simply ask that question, what would love do? Then do that. Mm. So it is never 
too late to find peace. And the moment you find inner peace, even if it's taken you 90 years to find it, it, you will instantly say it was worth it. I promise you, there is no other success worth anything in the world, only inner peace. Mm. It's the ultimate success, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, that's lovely, Jerry. And what an amazing um, letter that must have been to, to, to receive from that client and just to know that she was at peace um, where she was in her life. That's that's very, very powerful. And something I think that, that we can all um, use as inspiration, really. Um, so to finish off, I am going to read this and what you're you're welcome to close your eyes if you like um but please do really just like i said at the beginning of this webinar is is give your full attention to it let out all the distractions and the noise fade away and just bring your full self to it so we can start if you like just with a full and deep breath and then exhaling out cleansing and clearing Many of us worry about the world situation. We don't know when the bombs will explode. We feel that we are on the edge of time. As individuals, we feel helpless, despairing. The situation is so dangerous. Injustice is so widespread. The danger is so close. In this kind of situation, if we panic, things will only become worse. We need to remain calm to see clearly. I like to use the example of a small boat crossing the Gulf of Siam. In Vietnam, there are many people called boat people who leave the country in small boats. Often the boats are caught in rough seas or storms. The people may panic and the boats can sink. But if even one person aboard can remain calm, lucid, knowing what to do and what not to do, he or she can help the boat survive. His or her expression, face, voice, communicates clarity and calmness, and people have trust in that person. They will listen to what he or she says. One such person can save the lives of many. Our world is something like a small boat. Compared with the cosmos, our planet is a very small boat. We are about to panic because our situation is no better than the situation of the small boat in the sea. You know that we have more than 50,000 nuclear weapons. Humankind has become a very dangerous species. We need people who can sit still and be able to smile, who can walk peacefully, we need people like that in order to save us. Buddhism says that you are that person, that each of you is that person. In each woman, in each man, in each child, there is a capacity of waking up, of understanding and of loving. Some people allow it to develop and some do not, but everyone has it. This capacity of waking up, of being aware of what is going on in your feelings, in your body, in your perceptions, in the world is called Buddha nature. The capacity of understanding and loving. It is with our capacity of mindfulness, breathing and being peace that we can make peace. Thich Nhat Hanh. So those words really, like as you were speaking earlier, Jerry, so many of those things actually, it's it's almost like you couldn't you couldn't um, script it in terms of how you touched on so many of those points 
throughout uh, our conversation this evening and how they all just come together beautifully through those words written by, by Thich Nhat Hanh. So I'm going to finish there. I can, I'm absolutely so proud. I'm finishing exactly at 60 minutes. Again, the universe is working with us this evening. I want to thank you so much, Jerry, for your time and your energy. And I really know that from the comments here this evening, you have helped a lot of people, inspired them. And um, we will look forward to hopefully working together again uh, at some point and give my love to Miriam and a big kiss to Eli. And uh, thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who, who has joined us this evening. It's been such a pleasure to have you, your comments. We're going to select those winners. And what we'll do is uh, we'll email them uh, directly. So I'll get some information from Soul Space that we need to, to give those people that access to your amazing, uh, to Miriam's amazing course. So thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Fiona. I just want to say thank you for all that you do and thank you for all that you are. You are um, a beacon of light, humility and kindness. Um, and th what I love about you is also when it comes to knowing your business and craft, I put you on the same level uh, as any of the greats that you spoke about. You do with such humility um, and I think Ireland can be very proud of people like Ivor Brown, um, people who have been pioneers in a very humble way. And I think you're up there. It's it's my honor to to uh, to be on with you. And um, so just thank you for having me. I think you're you're phenomenal. You're so humble and understated, and yet the work you do is, is so incredibly powerful. And the presence you have is kind and loving. And every time I've been in your space, you're kind and loving. So you, everything we speak about tonight, you live it. Um, so um, just thank you for having me on. And just please keep doing what you're doing. You're an incredible human being. And we're very lucky to have you here in this country. So keep doing oh, what you're really doing. Jerry. My ego's, I'm noticing my ego. <laughs> and I'm telling her to be quiet, ego. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sherry. Listen, lots of love, and we'll see each other again soon. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for very coming. much. Thank you, everybody. God bless. God bless. Bye bye. Take care.